Hi, this is Catherine. This is Taking Tea with Catherine. This is peppermint lemon tea, which I like, but mainly I'm drinking it because it is um, a little therapeutic. I have a little bit of the remains of a migraine. I know, I talk about it all the time. I don't get chronic migraine, but when I do, it's a little bit distracting. So that's why I'm not wearing, even though it's a tea and mystery video, <clears throat> I'm not wearing the hat. I'm just, and also it keeps me mysterious. You'll always know when I'm gonna wear the hat, right? So, so yeah, and so I also thought I'd mention the migraine because if I flub my words a little bit, I have an excuse. <laughs> you know what? Exploit the migraine. Anyway, uh, so I am doing just a kind of a check-in, almost review-ish, but not quite, a little hybrid, I guess, of, um, you know, the three books that I finished so far for, in this month for March Mystery Madness. And, um, yeah, it's a lot for just the first week of March, but that's okay. I am happy to be, you know, immersed, immersed in mystery, even though it's a little bit of a detriment to the rest of the books that I'm trying to read this month, but I might take a pause and read other things. Whatever. Uh, one of them is very historical related, so it might get me to start reading more history just because I'm in that mood now. But um, two of the books I'm also going to show you some books that I've hauled recently because I thought, you know, <coughs> excuse me, doing um, straight up hauls is not always bad, but um, can get a little dull occasionally. So I thought I would mix it up a little bit and have it slightly themed. So here we go. So the first book that I read this month is um, an Agatha Christie. And I'm very excited about that because I love Agatha Christie. And I don't know if this is a reread. I read a bit of Agatha Christie in college, which is a long time ago now, and I didn't keep records that I know of, of what I read. I probably mostly read the books that we already had at home, which I still have, pretty much. So it might not, I might not have read this one. I've seen adaptations. But either way, it felt, it felt new. So whether I'm returning to it or reading it for the first time, it's good times. And that is the very first Miss Marple uh, novel. There was, she was briefly in a short story a few years earlier, but this is Murder at the Vicarage by, yes, Agatha Christie. And, you know, I was thinking about the year this came out, which was 1930, and I was thinking about the year 1930, which was not a great time. I mean, not that this time has been so great either, but um, it was like the early days of the Great Depression and things were just rough, you know? First in the United States and then all over the place. And uh, thinking just as somebody during the time, even if you had still a decent job, a decent enough situation, it was probably rough to see what was going on in the world, right? And you might need a little bit of comfort reading uh, mysteries, you know? Just like, just like we know during COVID and everything, wanting to read... You know, sometimes mysteries could be cheerful, even if it's a murder mystery. It's a way of just escaping a little bit into something else. Excuse the radiator. It always decides to, like, chat a little bit with us during the video in a very hissy manner. So, so that's good. So, people's needs were definitely being met. Agatha Christie was constantly writing. Dorothy Sayers was writing. There are tons of other, tons of other writers that are not springing to mind right now because, let's blame the migraine. I think Nancy Drew's first book came out in 1930. So that's pretty cool. But uh, at the same time, in the middle of the year, there's some really bad news <laughs> for mystery lovers. If you were someone who, followed, who was regularly reading detective novels and just, you know, cut your teeth, or whatever the word is, whatever the expression is about, um, you know, Sherlock Holmes and, you know, Maybe you got into other writers afterwards, but he might have been your first one and your favorite. To find out about Arthur Conan Doyle's death must have been a little bit earth shattering for some people because um, he was such a mainstay for such a long time at that point. And even though I don't think he wrote a lot in the last few years of his life, I'm sure people were always kind of like, I wonder if something new is going to come out by him and every so once in a while it did so that must have been rough you know and <laughs> like I barked rough <laughs> but 
yes, people were already writing pastiches and, you know, Sherlock Holmes stories were going to continue, um, but not the originals unless, unless new ones were unearthed. So it must have been a sad time indeed for the mystery world. So to basically introduce a new recurring person in the mystery world must have been kind of nice and exciting. So Miss Marple was nothing like Sherlock Holmes in terms of appearance and personality, really. Um, except maybe being observant, but um, Sherlock Holmes is actually mentioned a couple times in this book. So, you know, I, I, I mean, we knew Agatha Christie liked Sherlock Holmes and she even knew Arthur Conan Doyle. So that's kind of cool. But anyway, um, but she was quite different, but that might have been nice to have a little change. And, you know, there may have been something resembling cozy mysteries before that. But I think Miss Marple is kind of like the mother of the cozy mystery, you know? And there's just something that is comforting about just a small town in England where everybody's, you know, just living their little lives and then someone turns up dead and then everyone's running around trying to figure out what happened and looking at each other suspiciously and then this little old lady who, yeah, she seems kind of smart, but she just, you know, inexperienced or whatever in life, maybe, in other, you know, in other things in life. But she's, she comes through and solves the mystery from the very, you know, from the very first book. Um, so yeah, and you can tell Vicarage is going to be kind of cozy anyway, because, you know, so kind of small. The other thing is, which happens in a lot of first books, you know, of a series, there is a mention about how, you know, nothing ever happens here. And it's like, well, things are going to start happening. And I always thought it was kind of funny when people write that because it's like, oh, look, in our town, no one ever gets murdered. And now every other year, there's going to be a book out where someone's getting murdered in this town. It's a bit unrealistic, but you know what? We're going to take that, you know, as it is. So there's a man named Colonel Proth Prothero. I don't know how to pronounce his name. And he is not a well-liked person in the community. He's well off and he has a wife and a daughter, but he's not popular. I think he's a warden, but he's not like Trollope's warden. He's just kind of messed up. And he um, one day turns up dead at the vicarage. And although people don't really look at the vicar, whose point of view this book um, comes in as the as a, a suspect, he even had some kind of like this guy should be dead, <laughs> you know, commentary. So there are, I think in Miss Marple's um, thoughts about seven possible suspects. And obviously she does figure it out after a time. Um, but she, you know, she, she doesn't come out with it until she actually is assured. And she, you know, she actually knows about it before everyone else does, but wants to make sure, which is good. She also reads detective novels as well. So she's pretty cool. She, she, she has a garden and, you know, she spends time in her garden. So she'll pop up out of nowhere when you think she's not around. It's pretty great. But, uh, the vicar is just kind of like in a spot where people kind of usually take a shortcut and pass through. So like anybody could have been in the area and anybody, you know, a lot of people had motive to kill this man and some people, um, had more motive. So who done it? Well, I'm not telling you, but it is a good book. Only thing I can say as a criticism, which is not a major criticism, is that it could have used a little more Miss Marple. She's in the book, but she's not constantly. But maybe that's the point of Miss Marple, that she's not always right there in the middle of the investigation. So, yeah, that's my personal criticism. My other has nothing to do with the actual story. It's this edition, which is a library book. I thought the way it looked, it kind of looked like a... um large print, but it wasn't. Um, but I look at the price of this book, $30. Now I'm not saying that these aren't valuable books, but I'm like, if that was like the same, not obviously $30, but if whatever it translated to in, in, um, 1930s currency, um, and inflation or whatever, if that was about how much it would have cost, you know, for people at that time, that's a lot. You know what I mean? I, I, I 
cannot understand who would, no offense to this book, no, how, no matter how good it is, who would spend $30 on a book that is, let me see, in this volume, it is under 300 pages. My goodness. But anyway, that's just a me thing. I will sometimes pay money for, you know, things that are somewhat attractively bound or whatever, but my goodness. Speaking of which, um, let's go into the two uh, related hauls. I went to book off again, and I found this volume, which is a slightly older volume of uh, Poster and the Fate by Agatha Christie. And um, this is a Tommy and Tuppence story, which I haven't actually read any of them. So I may not do this so soon, but I'm still kind of happy that I found this. Um, it has the Dodd Mead and Company imprint in here. And um, this one says 1973. I don't know if that's when it came out or if that's when this edition is. But I know this looks like an old kind of vintage edition, so it's possible that it is from the 70s. So this book could be older than me. And that is cool. It looks, it just looks old. But it was only a dollar. So that's cool, right? I just love that. Um, got a little red in the top, you know. Some people might not like the look of this, but I, I think it's fine. But I had a coupon, I, you know, for Barnes & Noble. And I used it to get, I already have two of the other, um, of these pretty bound, uh, Agatha Christie. So I got the third one, the most recent one. <clears throat> and this is, uh, Death on the Nile and other Hercule Poirot mysteries. And the other two are the ABC Murders and Five Little Pigs, which I think I have already a copy of at least Five Little Pigs and Death on the Nile. So I may end up giving it away at some point, you know, um... But this one is just pretty, and it and it completes the set. I think. I mean, they may make, they may make more of them, but um, you know, full price these come at about twenty five dollars. So three three novels for twenty five. Uh, it's just over what eight dollars each one, which is a bit cheaper than thirty dollars. You know, so this is altogether is less than thirty dollars at full price. So you see what I mean. I just don't get things. I just don't get it. But anyway, um, so that was a nice little thing for me. So moving on, I also read, speaking about Sherlock Holmes, as we did a minute ago, um, not an original Sherlock Holmes, uh, although I want to do a little more of that this year, but mm -hmm. um, a pastiche. <clears throat> and this one is from the 70s, so it is um, obviously not very recent. But this is The 7% Solution by Nicholas Meyer. It, of course, comes out as, oh, you know, this is yet another discovered writing by Dr. Watson. He felt that it couldn't be published at the time because people who were involved wouldn't want it to be known, etc., and reasons. That is the most common thing that is said in a lot of pastiches. But that's okay because it makes sense. But it is it is a different story that I'm used to, although I've read enough Sherlock Holmes inspired stories that are a bit odd. Like there was the one I think it was called The Fifth Heart by Dan Simmons, I think. I don't have a copy of it. I lent it to somebody and I never got it back again. So if I ever see it at Book Off, maybe I'll get it, but I'm not gonna just buy it. Anyway, and that was, I think, Sherlock Holmes meeting up with Henry James, and and Sherlock Holmes is going through like a little crisis where he thought, I think I'm a fictional character. So it went on from there, and so that was already kind of bizarre. That came later, obviously. But um, this one is, well, it's called The 7% Solution, which basically is the the uh, dose of cocaine that Sherlock Holmes used to take. So Watson is very concerned as a doctor and as a friend, um, from things he's seen, you know, as a result of this addiction. So, um, he enlists the help of Dr. Freud, who is, who was a contemporary. And I always like it when they do stories where Sherlock Holmes meets contemporaries, you know, whether they're fictional or real people, just because I would, you would want to know what Sherlock Holmes would have made of that person. And Freud was kind of, um, kind of like a detective in his own way. So, um, I'm not, I'm not very well versed on him. Just, you know, the, the 
surface knowledge that a lot of people have who've taken psychology 101 and uh i don't like all of his methods but he was good in this book so so there's yeah there's dealing with the treatment of sherlock holmes and also a case comes up for the doctor um who I think he's actually called dr freud in here. <laughs> i don't remember but um it's in vienna that is um that turns into a mystery that Sherlock Holmes obviously gets involved with, which is great, except for, for me anyway, there's a chase scene that just goes on forever that exhausts me and is very unrealistic to me. That some people might like, actually. But I just, I don't know, it kind of like, it was good and then it wasn't. Like, it was like, all right, enough. Let's get to, you know. I don't mind reading action, obviously, but sometimes to a point. But it does lead up to a point where Sherlock Holmes says something along the lines of to, to Watson, you know, never let them say you were just my Boswell, which is a great line because, you know, um, he calls him his Boswell, which, you know, if you know anything about um, Samuel Johnson, Boswell was kind of like a biographer or a memoirist or whatever of Johnson as they spent a lot of time together. So that kind of works. But yes, we know that Watson is so much more than that. They're really good friends there. He's much more interactive and protective of him. It's fantastic. Um, so yes, I do say if you like Sherlock Holmes, if you read Sherlock Holmes already, um, and maybe if you like a little bit of psychology, I don't know, um, you might like this. I don't know if it's my very favorite, but it was definitely an enjoyable book for the most part for me. And, um, <laughs> and I think, um, I don't know how, but I think maybe the bad guy might be reprised in the next book that I've already had, The West End Horror. I'm not sure about that. Um, another, just, oh, before I forget, another thing that they do with this, though, is that um, they take some of the, some very famous stories in the Sherlock Holmes canon and make it as if this, that was a cover for what really happened here, which people have done that in different stories before, but it, it, I both liked it, but I also kind of was like, oh, but I also like that story, so that's kind of sad. And, you know, con you know, considering what it involves. But, you know what? It's kind of nice to have things turn up kind of differently, you know? Um, and you learn a lot about Sherlock Holmes here that obviously Conan Doyle didn't write, but would have been a bit, wow, you know what I mean? So there you go. <laughs> and... Last but not least was my historical mystery reread. So it's not just TN mystery, it's TN history. Yes. I love, if you watch this channel long enough, you probably know, I do love reading English history. I like a lot of different kinds of history, but English history is probably my favorite. And um, there's numerous types of kings and queens that I like to read about. Um, but one of the most interesting to me is Richard the third in terms of just what happened. I know that the current, you know, the staunch belief of many and you know, even historians that I quite respect and have read and enjoyed is that Richard the third killed his nephews who were, you know, next in line for the throne, his older brother's sons. Sadly, um, his brother died a little too young and his sons were teenagers or one of them was a teenager and the other one was younger I think so boy kings were not a good idea true but what would have caused Richard III to have been so loyal to his brother all this time and then suddenly not only usurp but declare his his nieces and nephews illegitimate and then the boys disappeared and were presumed dead and you know it would appear that he was responsible for all of this, which could make sense, but it could make sense that maybe he wasn't responsible for this. And I am not necessarily a full on romantic in a lot of ways, you know, but there's a part of me that finds it just very intriguing that possibly he was innocent and that because the Battle of Bosworth, you know, did him in and Henry Tudor became Henry the Seventh and probably, you know, had his historians tell things, you know, in, the, in a more favorable light, you know, as one would do. You know, that they painted him to be more of a villain than he was, and then Shakespeare came along and really solidified his reputation. And, 
again, we don't know exactly what happened. We don't have exact proof, but this book basically is, well, it's part of a mystery a series, actually, that Josephine Tay wrote. I haven't read the other books by of uh, Inspector Grant, so now I want to again. <laughs> I wanted to when I read it the first time, somehow I didn't. But um, Inspector Grant is convalescing, he has an injury, and he is in a hospital. The entire book basically takes place in the hospital. But, um, so he's bored, and <clears throat> a friend of his brings him some portraits, just because he likes to study faces, that's part of what he does. And he sees the one of Richard III and is like, he just doesn't come across as a killer. And, you know, especially of that magnitude. So he becomes interested. He starts reading different books. He gets a hold of different things. He talks to a research historian uh, who's from America and they become, you know, friendly and they go over a whole bunch of different possibilities and, you know, they just investigate. It's like a murder mystery, but historical. So whatever you believe, you know, if you're a Ricardian, which are the people who very, very, very much believe that Richard III is innocent, or whether you think, no, he was the murderer, or if you're like me and think, well, I would like to believe that he was innocent, but I can't be, you know, I can't be sure really, you know? Um, but I don't want, I am not absolute that he was either way. I'm just not. I just like to, I like to be open to, you know, different argument, you know? Not that I like to argue. But anyway, whichever way, this book is so cool if you like history and mystery, but especially history because, especially of this time, because there's just so much talk about the Woodville family, the Nevilles, the Tudors, Richard III himself, you know, that time period really a little bit and what would have gone into a new, you know, dynasty really and what what would have happened, like how, how tr some truths may have been covered up and some may have been doctored and some may have somehow still come through. We don't know. So it's kind of, and this is written by an English, well, she's actually Scottish, I think, but you know, British writer who went to school and heard a lot of these histories. This, these are not things I learned in my history class at all. I don't think I heard about Richard III until after college, probably. Because I read Shakespeare, but I didn't read Richard III. So, you know, so a lot of readers of the time probably would have been familiar with what they're talking about, as the inspector was familiar with bits and of things, but just takes on a different perspective. I think this really probably kicked off a lot of people trying to prove Richard innocent. Again, who knows? So anyway, but I loved it. I love this book. Five stars. And once again, and these are the books that are halls that are related to it in some way. This is uh, another book by Josephine Tay, The Singing Sands. It's another Inspector Grant. So I'm looking forward to that. Found it for a dollar at Book Off. These next two are both also dollar book offs. Love it. Um, this is Chris Skidmore, Bosworth, The Birth of the Tudors. The Battle of Bosworth is where Richard III was defeated by Henry Tudor. And, um, so that should be interesting. I know that there are some people who basically crossed lines, um, at a deciding moment, which would have been it for Richard. So that will probably be covered here as well. This is Stephen Greenblatt's Tyrant, Shakespeare on Power. It was three for two at Blackwell, but one dollar at Book Off. It talks about different Shakespeare plays, but I, I noticed in the index it's going to cover a lot of Richard III. So, and I have to read Richard III already, Shakespeare. I can't believe I've never read it. Um, and then this is um, the last one. This is a um, library book. This is The Perfect Prince, The Mystery of Perkin Warbeck and His Quest for the Throne of England by Anne Rowe. So, <clears throat> a little further into Henry Tudor's reign, when everything seems to be pretty established... Um, this guy comes by and he's like, I'm one of the princes in the tower. He didn't probably say it like that, but you know, I'm the rightful king, basically. So, um, and he would have claimed to have been the younger brother. So if the older brother would have died and then he would have been next in line. Big threat to Henry the Seventh, you know? Uh... So I'm curious to see how everything's handled. Even though I've read things in history books about Perkin Warbeck 
Um, I haven't read it recently, so I want to see how this is. I've heard good things about this book, so I'll let you know what I think when I finally read it. So that is all for this first week of reading. I am so excited because these are all very good books, and I hope to come back again with some more um, mysteries, but um, I also have a lot of history to read right now. So let me know if you've read any of these books, what you think um, of, all, of any of these books, of any of these stories, etc. Until we meet again, this is Catherine taking tea with Catherine. Have a lovely tea and mystery-filled day.